I invite you this morning to get the YouVersion outline. Uh, make that available to yourself. If you use the YouVersion app on your phone or your tablet, you'll be able to follow along very easily with uh, the message for today. Today we're in our series, The Holy Spirit. And just so you know, I think we're going to extend this. We were going to go into First and Second Timothy, but we're going to extend that in the next few weeks. I feel like we should spend just a little bit more time on the Holy Spirit because there's so much to learn about the Holy Spirit of God. Today I want to talk to you about the work of the Holy Spirit. How many of you, when you go to work, you have a job description? Your, your boss gives you like a written list of the things that you're supposed to do. How many of you are glad for a job description because it tells you what to do, right? How many of you are glad for your job description because it tells you what not to do? <laughs> Don't do these things. And sometimes that's a little bit helpful as well. The Holy Spirit essentially has a job description as the Bible describes to us what the Holy Spirit does. Last week when we talked about the Holy Spirit, we talked about the Holy Spirit being a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a force. It's not like gravity. It's not the force from Star Wars. The Holy Spirit of God is a person. And the Holy Spirit has a will, an intellect, feelings, emotions, thoughts, can communicate with you, wants to relate to you. We talked about the person of the Holy Spirit. When we talk about receiving the Holy Spirit, we're talking about receiving a person, being in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And you can only be in relationship with the Holy Spirit in this special way through our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we're going to discuss why that is and, and how that works today. I think that the Holy Spirit can be experienced by every person alive on earth today. The Holy Spirit can be experienced by every person that's alive on earth today, but there's a special closeness when you've accepted Christ as your Savior, and we're going to describe what that is and what the Holy Spirit is doing in the course of your day and every day. As Pentecostal people, we believe that we can experience God tangibly. We can experience God tangibly. I remember the first time I went to a Pentecostal charismatic church service where people were full of the Holy Spirit, and they expected to experience God tangibly. I'd been to other kinds of churches. I'd been to several other kinds of churches as a kid. But it was in that moment, in that church service, that I experienced something physical, and I did not know what it was. I experienced something tangible that was impressed upon my life in such a way that I physically felt it. And I was like, what is that? And I remember I went to this church service with my mom. It was a Wednesday night Bible study. How many of you think sometimes Wednesday night Bible studies can be a little mundane? They can be kind of plain. On a plain old mundane Wednesday night Bible study, this 15-year-old kid showed up with his mom. And I looked at my mom and I said, what is this? And she looked at me and she said, I don't know. It might be the presence of God. And I was like, is that a thing? You know, can that even be? Is that even a possibility? I mean, I, I knew there's a God, but could you experience him tangibly like I'm feeling his presence right now? That had never been a thing possible in my mind. And we as Pentecostals believe that we can experience God tangibly. And I believe the Bible describes a whole lot of experiences that all of us should experience with the Holy Spirit. There are certain just standard experiences that we should all have with the Holy Spirit. Is everybody with me today? And I think the Bible describes that there are just some normal things that you're going to experience with the Holy Spirit. Now, when you experience those things, it's pretty awesome and it's pretty big, and so it might not seem mundane and it might not seem normal to you at the moment. You know what I'm saying? But they are standard experiences that the Bible says that we should have with God. And I think that sometimes we make the Holy Spirit so mystical that people miss the normal, simple things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in people's lives. Is everybody with me today? God has some standard experiences that he wants you to have with the Holy Spirit. And we can understand those standard experiences that we'll have with the Holy Spirit when we understand the work of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? What is in his job description? Is everybody with me today? So let's look at his job description and, and see that the first thing that the Holy Spirit always does in every part of his job description, everything that he does, the Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit always exalts Jesus Christ. Let me go just one step farther and just say this. The Holy Spirit doesn't even exalt himself as a person of the Godhead. 
And some of you are like, well, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit is fully God. Yes, the Holy Spirit is fully God. But the Holy Spirit is always pointing to Jesus, the Son of God. And Jesus is always reconciling us to the Father, Father God. Is everybody with me today? And you see that in their job descriptions, there's redemption and salvation that is accomplished. The Holy Spirit always exalts and points people to Jesus. Jesus always offers life and reconciliation with the Father. Do you see the job description? Look at this scripture. John chapter 15, 26, Jesus said that when the advocate, the counselor, the comforter, the parakletos, the paraclete comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. What will the Holy Spirit be doing? He will testify about Jesus. He points people to Jesus. He exalts Jesus. And then Jesus says, and you must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. I believe the Holy Spirit is working on every person that is alive today. He is working right now to point every single person on the planet to Jesus. Every single person. God is not willing that people should perish and not have eternal life and experience an eternity without God in hell. God, God is not willing that that should be the case. It is the case for many people that reject Christ. But the Holy Spirit is working hard to point people to Jesus and exalt Jesus at all times. You have many unsaved friends, family members, neighbors, people that you know, people that you care about, maybe people that even live far away that are unsaved. You care about them. You know them. I'm telling you, Jesus is working on them right now by his Holy Spirit. Yes. He's working on them right now by his Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit of God is pointing them to salvation in Jesus Christ all over the world. Yes. And it doesn't matter what religion they are, every Buddhist, every Muslim, every atheist, it doesn't matter. Jesus is is receiving glory. He is receiving attention because the Holy Spirit is constantly pointing each human being individually and all of humanity towards the Son. Is everybody with me today? Yeah. The Holy Spirit exalts Jesus. Here's the second thing the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit convicts people. For many of us, the first experience that we may have had with the Holy Spirit was actually conviction. Some people say to me, Pastor, I just don't know if I can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Well, were you convicted of your sin before you were saved? Yeah, I remember. I remember that guilt. I remember that weight of sin. I remember like the, the, the knowledge that I need the Savior. That was the Holy Spirit speaking to you. If you could hear the Holy Spirit then, you can hear the Holy Spirit. That's kind of refreshing, isn't it? It's like, well, I can hear the Holy Spirit. He spoke to me before I was even saved. And he said, Jesus is right and your sins are wrong. It's that simple. I mean, <laughs> that's kind of a simple message, isn't it? Jesus is right, and your sins are wrong. It's conviction. I remember before I was saved, the things I was convicted of. One of the things I was convicted of when I got saved is that, uh, oh, I'm just going to tell you. It's a little embarrassing, but I had snuck into a movie. I went in the back door, and I didn't get a ticket, and I, I snuck into the movie theater, and, and they caught me. And the manager said, where's your ticket stub? And I said, I dropped it in the urinal. <laughs> he rolled his eyes, threw his hands up in the air and said, watch the movie. I felt so bad. And then the Lord just kept convicting me and kept convicting me. Now there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I was convicted of as well, but that was one of those things. And I'll tell you what happened. When I got saved, after I was a saved believer, a couple months into my salvation, the Holy Spirit convicted me again and said, go pay for that movie ticket because you did stick around and watch the movie. And so I went to the movie theater and I had my cash. And I said, hey, I snuck into the movie theater a couple months ago and I want to pay for my ticket. And the girl went, what? <laughs> There's a lit young woman working the counter on the other side of the glass. And she goes, what? She yelled over to the manager by the popcorn stand, hey, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know what to do with this. The manager came over and I said, hi, I snuck into a movie and I shouldn't have done it and I, and I want to pay for my ticket. He says, I can't take money from you unless you buy a ticket. I'm like, well, can I just give you the money? 
And he goes, no, I can't take money unless you're buying a ticket. He's like, just forget it. He's like, get out of here. And he was mad at me now too. I'm like, oh no. And so he walked away after he said, get out of here. And then I thought, I'm getting, I'm going to pay for a ticket one way or another. And I looked at the girl and I said, uh, I'll take an adult ticket for whatever. And I bought a ticket. I tore it in half and laid it on the counter and walked away. I was like, God, I'm paying for a ticket. And that was conviction. You see what I'm saying? And, I, and I'm just saying that the Holy Spirit convicts people. You know, John chapter 16, verses 7 and 11 says this, Very truly I tell you, it's for your good that I'm going away. Jesus said, it's going to be good that I ascend to heaven. I'm not just going to stick around on earth forever. He could have. He rose from the dead. He's alive. He could just stick around forever, Right? But he said, it's good for you that I go away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. So he's going to prove the world is wrong about sin. He's also going to prove that he is right in righteousness and God is right in his judgments. The Holy Spirit does that work when he convicts us. God's judgment is right and my judgment about my sin has been wrong. And Lord, I'm ready for you to forgive me and cleanse me and for me to be reconciled to God. That's the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. How many of you are glad that the Holy Spirit convicts us? How many of you are glad that I just explained to you that the Holy Spirit has already spoken to you and you're like, oh yeah, I guess I could hear the voice of the Holy Spirit again. Do you realize that? You said yes to his conviction already once. He's already spoken to you once. So listen for his Holy Spirit to speak to you in that same manner again when you need his wisdom, his direction, his guidance. You don't know how to understand the scriptures. Listen for him to speak to you similarly in the future because that's how he speaks. Is everybody ready? So the Holy Spirit convicts. Romans chapter 1, verse 32, listen to this little scripture. Although they knew God, although the world knew God and his righteous decrees, that those who do such things, such sinful things, deserve death, they not only continue to do those very things, but they approve of those who practice them. Even in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says that God is convicting people of sin and righteousness. So the Holy Spirit convicts people. Here's the next thing. The Holy Spirit regenerates the believer. The Holy Spirit was at work in your life when you got saved. Listen to this, John chapter 3, verses 5 and 8. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he said, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit is a part of that regenerating work. He is working in your life when you're born again. And flesh gives birth to flesh. Many of you have children of your own. You understand that. But Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And when a person is born again, the Spirit is doing that rebirthing, that born again work in you. The Bible says the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal bodies for his service. It's the Holy Spirit that was at work in us when we were saved and we were born again and we were receiving new life. The Holy Spirit is present at regeneration and has a part in that regenerating work. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is raising you up to live a new life because you're born again and you're regenerated in Christ. Is everybody with me? I'm not just reconciled to God. I'm not just justified and my slate has been wiped clean. I'm a new person. I'm a new creation. I've got a new heart that God has put in me, Ezekiel said, and I've got a new spirit that was birthed in me. And that was the resurrecting power of the spirit regenerating my life. Is everybody with me today? Regeneration doesn't mean forgiven. Regeneration doesn't mean I felt better. Regeneration means I'm new, I'm born again. I've got a new heart, a new spirit. I'm a new creation. Is everybody with me? That's good news, isn't it? Next, I want you to see the next thing in the Holy Spirit's job description. The Holy Spirit lives or dwells in, abides in believers. John chapter 14, verse 15 and 17. Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, keep my commands and I'll ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Who is the advocate? It's the spirit of truth. 
The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. So he's talking to the disciples. He's like, right now you have been with the Holy Spirit, but there's a day coming after Jesus finished his work on the cross where the Holy Spirit would be in them. He gave them that promise. The Holy Spirit would be in them, the spirit of truth. And when Jesus rose from the grave on that first resurrection Sunday night, he showed up to the disciples. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And he breathed on them, a picture of God breathing life into the clay in Genesis chapter 2. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. They believe Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They believe that he rose from the grave because he's standing right there and they can touch him. They believe that he is Lord. They know everything they need to know to be a New Testament believer. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's at that moment that the Spirit indwells them. That's when the Spirit indwelled the believers. He lives in us. He lives in you. Listen to the process Jesus gave us in John chapter 14. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. So let's love the Lord. Let's keep his commands. Let's receive and be aware of his spirit living in us. And lastly, let's welcome the spirit to constantly abide in us. Let him abide, abide, abide. How many of you had somebody get really mad at you when something wasn't going right? And they're like, I just can't abide with that. Maybe every, the old Western term, I can't abide that. I can't abide with that. You know what that means? I can't live with it. I can't live with that, right? The Holy Spirit has chosen to live, to abide in you. He's like, I will abide in you. I'll abide with you and in you. Well, that's good news, right? That I have the Holy Spirit of God living in me. There are so many scriptures that we can point to about the indwelling Holy Spirit that's so wonderful and so beautiful. Next, I want you to see the Holy Spirit seals believers. When you were saved, you received a mark that you're saved. And the mark is not that all of a sudden your hair is shiny, like your friends are saying, you're just glowing. You look, what happened? Oh, it's my new conditioner. <laughs> Have you lost weight? You just look so good. Well, it was, I got saved. I, don't you wish that was the case? I mean, that's not always the case. It, it's not like some outward mark. It's not like I got a stamp on the wrist. I, I, I got my ticket. I got into the game, and I got a stamp. I got the mark. I got the seal. It's not like that. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that is in your life that makes you different from everybody around you. And the Holy Spirit in us should make us different. I mean, people should notice that the Holy Spirit of God is in us. If the Holy Spirit of God is in us, they should be real, they should be tangible, they should be noticeable. It's the seal that marks you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is everybody with me today? The Holy Spirit seals us. Ephesians 4 says this, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And he gave me that mark as a seal, as a mark that says, you've been bought for the day of redemption. God's got a promise he's going to fulfill in you. When you experience the Holy Spirit living inside of you and you feel his presence and you feel his joy or you feel his strength in you as a believer, just know God's reminding you that you've been sealed for the day of redemption when your salvation will be completed. Your salvation will be completed in mind, body, and Spirit. And so because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, and every form of malice. Just get rid of those things. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. So with the Holy Spirit living in me, I have a mark, I have this seal, but the seal shows up in the way my character shines. It's not my hair shining. It's my character shining. And the Holy Spirit is obvious in my life because of the way that he causes me to love others, to get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, and malice. So the Holy Spirit seals us. Here's the next thing I want you to be reminded. Can I just say this real quick? Maybe you're here today and you're like, sometimes I just don't know if God loves me. I've asked Jesus to be my savior. I've done everything I know to do to feel secure in God, and I don't feel I don't feel secure in God yet. 
You need an experience with the Holy Spirit who has sealed you. You need an experience with God's love that will be revealed to you and affected upon your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but I messed up so many times after I chose Jesus. And you know what? Some of those times that I messed up, I knew it was wrong. I knew I was wrong, and I did it anyway. How could God forgive me when I was so blatantly walking on the precious blood of Jesus? How could he forgive me? How could he forgive me? You know what you need? You need a moment with the Holy Spirit who has sealed you for your day of redemption to assure you that you are his child. And that, that assurance, I can't tell you enough in my preaching to make that sure in your mind and in your spirit. Only the Holy Spirit of God can make that real to you. And you need an experience with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. amen. How many of you had that experience with the Holy Spirit when you really needed it a time or two? Absolutely. Sometimes we need it once, and then a few months later, we need it again. And then a few years later, I need it again. In the first service, I just got to tell you, I stood down here during altar time, and I got it again. Praise God. And uh, he, he, wants to, he wants to seal you for that day of redemption. Next, I want you to see that the Holy Spirit guides believers. He guides us. The Holy Spirit living in us guides us. He gives us direction for our life. Romans chapter 8 says this, those that are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Those that are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are God's children. When you're saved, I just want you to know this. I'll put it this way using that scripture. The direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life is your inheritance. One time recently, I had a person say to me, I just don't think I have the gift of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. I can't get God's direction for my life. I don't have that gift. I said, stop, 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 stop. That's not a gift. That's an inheritance. That's not a gift. That's an inheritance of the child of God. And as a child of God, and I don't want to step over bounds here, but I'll, I'll say it this way to help you understand it. It's not a gift. It's a right. Like some of you, your kids, your kids have a right to take your credit card when you give it to them and go put gas in the car, right? You, get, you gave them the right. They have the right to go use that credit card to spend your money. How many of you have done that for your kids on one thing or another, right? Hearing the direction of the Holy Spirit in your life is that kind of authority. Like God has given it to you for you to have that for it to be utilized by you because you are a child of God. So he says those that are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, and listen to this. Then he goes into this whole picture of how we've been adopted, and we cry out to the Father, Abba, Father, because we know we've been adopted. I know I can call him Abba. I don't have some doubt like maybe I'm his child, maybe I'm not. No, I am his child, and I cry out with boldness. I cry out with assurance, you're my father, you're my father, you're my father. And Abba is this, this term of affection. It's not just some legal term, but it's this close familial term. You're my dad. And because of that relationship, we're led by the Spirit of God. Good news, right? The Holy Spirit guides believers. He wants to guide you today. The Holy Spirit next... The Holy Spirit prompts us to worship. It's in his job description. Listen to what the Holy Spirit did for Jesus. At that time, Luke chapter 10, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father. Just that little bit right there. There's more to this scripture that I could read, but just that. Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father. The Holy Spirit prompted Jesus to worship the Father. And the Holy Spirit can prompt you to worship as well. The Holy Spirit can prompt you to worship, and maybe we're singing a song, and there are lyrics on the screen, but the Holy Spirit prompts you, stop singing the lyrics. I've got something else that I need you to talk to God about right now. You need to know you have freedom and liberty. Just break off, and you start worshiping God in your own words, and worship Him out loud, 
and give him thanks and give him praise and give him honor that he deserves in that moment that you're prompted by the Holy Spirit to worship God. Is everybody with me today? And I'm telling you, sometimes I feel like this description of Jesus, I mean, I'm so full of joy, I just want to worship God. I'm so full of his joy, I want to give him thanks. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Thank you, God, for saving me. And just out of nowhere, got a thought, let's worship God. Got a, got a feeling or emotion of happiness that the Lord did this thing, I'm going to give him praise right now, driving down the road. Thank you, God. I give you praise and worship for what you just did. God, I thank you for what you did in my family this weekend. God, I thank you for what you did in my life at church on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night during prayer time. God, I give you worship and I give you praise. And sometimes we're prompted to worship in the most unusual locations or places. You get, at the, to the top of a, you get to the top of a waterfall and you're hiking with your family and suddenly there's just this moment where you, you experience the things that God has created. You're like, God, I worship you for what you made. It's the Holy Spirit prompting you to worship in that moment. Is everybody with me today? And the Holy Spirit does prompt us to worship. And so when he does, worship him. These are just standard things that we all experience with the Holy Spirit. Am I right? All right. Here's another thing that I think is standard for believers to experience, and that is the Holy Spirit empowers us for witness, to be witnesses. Now listen, <clears throat> on the day that Jesus rose from the grave, he breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. But then he gave them some instructions while he was with them for 40 days, and then he ascended to heaven the Bible says that he ascended before their eyes and he was covered by a cloud and two angels stood there talking to the disciples. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here staring up into heaven? This same Jesus will return in like manner or in the same way that you saw him depart. And so Jesus ascended into heaven and he's coming back again someday and I believe soon. But Jesus gave them some instructions as to what they should do after he departed. Luke chapter 24 says this, I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Jesus said to the disciples who he breathed on and said, receive the Holy Spirit, he said to them, remain in the city. I've told you to go and preach the gospel to all creation. I said, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. I said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you, hang tight in Jerusalem, wait a little bit, tarry a little bit until you receive what the Father has promised. Then in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, again, while he was with the disciples, before he ascended into heaven, he said, it's not for you to know the times and the dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so there's that instruction again. You're going to receive power. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And they're like, well, wait a minute. We received the Holy Spirit that day when you breathed on us and we felt that presence of the Lord entering our hearts. But you're saying there's more and you're asking us to wait because the Holy Spirit wants to do some more in us and it's going to have something to do with power. It's going to have something to do with being your witness. It's going to have something to do with that job that you gave us where we're going to go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the world, preaching the gospel to all creation, making disciples of all nations, every ethnic group on the planet. And so let's wait and receive. And so they did. And the Bible says they waited 10 days. And 10 days later... We read about it in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost, or the celebration, the feast, the Jewish festival of Pentecost came, which was 10 days later, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is not the end of all the work of the Holy Spirit, but it is another standard experience that you can have and I encourage you to have with the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you to do what Jesus said. Ask the Father and he'll give the Holy Spirit. 
He wants to give more. And when he gives the Holy Spirit, he gives without measure. He wants the Holy Spirit to flow through your life, upon you, into you, and then through you and out to other people in ministry as a witness to Jesus Christ. He wants the Holy Spirit to flow through you. And Jesus said it would be like rivers of living water that flows from your innermost being. And the, the word for innermost being in Greek is like guts, like from your belly. Like from the, the core of who you are, the center of, your, of who you are. And God intends for you to receive more and more of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You've experienced that with the Lord. Can I tell you something? The Lord has more. The Lord has more. There's more of his Holy Spirit to experience and receive. I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want more of the Holy Spirit to flow through me. I want more of the Holy Spirit because, listen, I'm your pastor and you need more of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that, that we're all limited and you can only receive what has to come through me. That's not true. But I'm telling you this, I believe I've got a part to play and I better be responsible. I want more of the Holy Spirit. I want more of the joy of the Holy Spirit. I want more strength to witness. I want to hear his voice more clearly. I want to hear his guidance. I want to be more sure of my salvation than I've ever been before. It's an experience with the Holy Spirit that brings about these things that we desire and that we want. It's part of his job description. Is everybody with me today? And I challenge you today, seek the Lord and let him fill you with the Holy Spirit. There's two terms for this. One is full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And the word that John the Baptist used was that Jesus would baptize you in the Holy Spirit. When we baptize people at Lifestream Church, we get a big tank of water and we submerge them in the water. They are immersed in the water. Why? Because the word baptize means immerse. They are immersed in the water and they, can't, they come up out of the water. When Jesus was baptized, he was immersed in the water and he and John the Baptist came up out of the water. When a person experiences the baptism in the Holy Spirit, Jesus, your Savior, is immersing you in the Holy Spirit. He lives in you, but he also wants to come upon you, uh, to overflow, to cover, to immerse every part of you with his presence, his power, and all the work that he can do. Now, some of you say, well, I know some pastors, I know some ministers, they're not baptized in the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues like they did in Acts chapter 2. You know, what about that? Hey, I believe that any person that's already a witness, many of you, you're, you're witnesses, you're telling people about Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to make you more effective. The how, power of the Holy Spirit is going to make you better. That power of the Holy Spirit is going to help you to be effective in some ways that you and I maybe can't even or haven't imagined yet. And I challenge you with this. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Seek God for it. Tarry, wait. The disciples were told to tarry and wait. We may need to tarry and wait as well. And then just seek the Lord for it. And receive it when he gives it. And how do you know when he has given the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Well, in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19, in those places where people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other tongues. And so I believe that when God baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, you'll begin to speak in other tongues. In Acts chapter 2, they began to speak in other tongues, and the people that were there understood the languages that they spoke. That's called xenolalia. Then there are other times when people speak in an unknown tongue, a language that you don't know, and nobody around you understands it. That's called glossolalia. There are actually two Greek words for this and for that. We've had xenolalia in this room right here. A man gave a message in tongues. There happened to be a woman from Armenia that was here. She heard the message in tongues. She heard the interpretation of tongues. She came to me afterwards. She goes, that was my language. I said, the guy that gave the interpretation, did he say essentially the same thing that you heard? And she goes, yep. A, there were a couple words that were different, but it was the same, it was the same thought. I said, that's because it's an interpretation. <laughs> She's like, that was cool. I said, that was for you. Because the Bible says that tongues can be a sign for the unbeliever. And I encourage her to choose Jesus. That was a good moment for her, right? I've heard of, uh, oh, I can't tell you enough stories because we need to pray. But there are some really cool stories about how God does these things today. But I, I challenge you today. Seek the Lord for more of his Holy Spirit and just expect that you may begin speaking in other tongues. When he, when he baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, you will. And here's how it works. So God's doing his part. Look what happened in Acts chapter 4. The Holy Spirit came upon them 
and they spoke in tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, am I just going to start making noises? No, not ne- I'm not going to do that. I'm going to speak as the, I sense the Spirit enabling me. And sometimes what re- is required in the tearing is coming to that place where I sense what I'm supposed to be doing with God right now. But when it all comes together and he's, he's pouring out his Spirit upon us, and then we begin to speak in other tongues. There's empowerment that happens at that moment. It's incarnational. I'll call it incarnational. Here's another example of something that's incarnational. The Holy Spirit prompts you to witness. The Holy Spirit prompts you to pray for somebody. And now you've got to make up your mind. Am I going to do that or not? I mean, here I am on the sidewalk in plain daylight. All my neighbors are looking. And the Holy Spirit just told me to pray for my neighbor who's going to have knee replacement surgery. Am I going to speak up as the Holy Spirit is urging me and say, Frank, God just told me that I should pray for you. Can I, can I lay hands on you and pray for your healing? Am I going to do that or am I not going to do that? Listen, if I choose not to do that, even though the Spirit has come upon me to, to do that, if I choose not to do that, nothing will happen. Am I right? It'll be limited. If God does something in Frank, he'll have to do it through somebody else. But if I say yes, and God comes upon me and says do it, and then I do it, then something can happen. That's when it's accomplished. And that's what I believe the baptism of the Holy Spirit is like. And so I want to encourage you today to take some time before we close and to receive what the Lord has for you today. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to invite the musicians to come to the front. I don't want us to just talk about the Holy Spirit. I want us to experience the Holy Spirit. Is everybody with me today? I don't just want to talk about the Holy Spirit. I want you to experience the Holy Spirit. We are Pentecostals, and we believe that when people come to church, they should experience the tangible presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. And now it's time to do just that. Some of you have already been experiencing the Holy Spirit as I'm preaching. Some of you have already been encouraged. Some of you have already been made more sure of your salvation. Some of you have already received direction from the Holy Spirit. Some of you already feel that prompt to worship. Am I right? That's because the Holy Spirit is working even while I'm still talking. Come on, let's let him do his work today. And so the musicians are going to begin to play a song, and we're just going to worship God together. We're going to make this place a pray, place of prayer the last few minutes of the service. And here's what I'd like you to do. If you're here today and you'd say, hey, Pastor Paul, I need direction for my life. I want you to come stand right here. I'm going to move around and pray for people today. But I want you to just come and wait in the presence of the Lord. Wait. Wait on him. Hope in him. Trust in him. I need direction from the Lord. I want you to come stand right here and just, and just begin to, to ask God for that direction. Maybe you're here today and you say, I need, that. I need to feel the seal of the Spirit. I need to know that the Holy Spirit has testified with my spirit that I'm a child of God. Maybe you've gone through some situations and, and you're like, I'm not sure about God's love. I'm not sure about my salvation, whatever it is. I want you to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. If you've chosen Jesus as your Savior and you've asked for your sins to be forgiven, I want you to make your way to this spot right here and then just begin to say, Lord, would you reassure me? Would you show me today? Maybe you're here today and you say, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to have that experience. If God has made it available to New Testament believers, I want everything he has. You say, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I believe that when he baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, you'll begin to speak in other tongues. You'll be empowered to be a witness, and you're going to experience some things with the Holy Spirit that are going to be wonderful and joyous. If that's you, we want to pray for you right here. And maybe you're in the room today, and you say, I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but it's been so long since I experienced his presence. I need a new, fresh touch of the Holy Spirit today. This morning in the first service, I came down and prayed with a lady right here, and she just was beautifully and wonderfully refilled with the Holy Spirit this morning. It was so cool to just see the refreshing presence of God being poured out upon her. And I'll tell you, she was kind of like this. And as soon as she began to speak in other tongues, it was like her body became electrified and energized. And her hands went up like this. And I mean, her praise and her worship just took on a whole new level. And so, hey, uh, let's receive from the Lord today. Is you guys with me today? Begin moving right now. Begin moving right now. Let's begin to pray. Let's begin to seek the Lord. Let's trust the Lord to do his work this morning. Lord, we need you. We need your voice.